Hansen. I'm the Director of Public Programs at UC San Diego Extension, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to this conversation with Luis Alberto Correa and Stephen Schick. And, uh, Another special welcome too to a group of students who joined us tonight. Um, they're from the Chula Vista Learning Community School. Do I have that correct? Yes. Uh, this program is part of UC San Diego's Helen Edison Lecture Series, which was made possible by a major gift from the late Helen Edison. Uh, for the past 25 years, the series has presented public lectures like this one on issues that advance humanitarian purposes and objectives and represent the work of leading figures in a wide variety of disciplines. Uh, we're also very pleased to have the San Diego Central Library as our partner for several events in this year's Edison series. And our next program in this series will be again in this hall on uh, the night of May 16th, the uh, featured speaker will be a MacArthur Fellow and Pulitzer Prize winning author named Catherine Boo. Uh, and she'll be speaking on her work about poverty in India and in the US. Uh, there'll be more information on this uh, on the website soon. And our website address is helenedison.ucsd.edu. Uh, tonight's program is also presented in collaboration with the San Diego Symphony's It's About Time Festival, which has been curated by the As many of you know, for the past three weeks, the festival has sponsored an extraordinarily varied and rich array of musical and other arts events. And there are still many to come through its closing date on February 11th. Our discussion tonight is related in particular to a very special concert coming up this Saturday at UCSD, and Steve will tell you more about that in due course. Uh, our program will be in the form of a conversation tonight, followed by 15 to 20 minutes for, for questions from you, the audience. Uh, so at the conclusion of the main portion of the program, Steve will ask those of you who have questions to line up at this microphone here in the center aisle. Uh, we ask that you please frame your questions in the form of a question. And if you keep your questions brief. <laughs> and uh, at the conclusion of the Q&A, there will also be a book signing. Uh, the books, as you may have seen, are for sale uh, outside. And we'll have the signing table over in the library uh, shop at that point. Uh, finally, please note uh, no flash photography during tonight's event, and please take a moment to silence your phones or other devices. It's my great pleasure now to introduce our host for tonight, Steve Schick. Steve is active internationally as a percussionist, conductor, and author, and for his many fans here, he requires no introduction. He's made UCSD in San Diego his home for more than two decades. And our local arts community has been immensely enriched by his remarkable creativity and artistic leadership. Uh, in addition to his position as distinguished professor and Reed Family Presidential Chair in the Department of Music at UCSD, Steve also serves as music director of the Hoya Symphony and Chorus and as the artistic director of the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players. He's championed contemporary percussion music by commissioning or premiering more than 150 new works. Uh, I always have to include this quote from music reviewer Alex Ross of The New Yorker. He gave him what has to be the ultimate accolade for an artist, referring to him as one of our supreme living virtuosos, not just of percussion, but of any instrument. So uh, please join me now. With that having been said, I think I can leave. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, overly generous introduction. 
Uh, my name is Stephen Chick, and I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, we're thrilled to be here with Helen Edison Lecture Series, and as a part of the San Diego Symphony's It's About Time Festival. I see my colleagues from the symphony here, and I see my colleagues from the university and from Helen Edison here, and it makes me happy to be living in San Diego with the richness that we have, both in people and in art, in culture and in nature. This is a grand place, and so so happy that you're all here to, to join us in a celebration of that place. Uh, when people talk about Luis Urrea as a border writer, he objects with good reason, think, saying that he is not interested in borders, but bridges. He is a novelist, a poet, a documentarian, a journalist, and an activist. And for decades, both as a person and as an artist, he has knitted together cultures in a way that makes them legible, that makes them important, and makes them impactful for all of us. And we are extraordinarily grateful for that. He is here, well, partly to talk together and in front of you, and also for a performance on Saturday night at 7.30 in the Mandeville Auditorium of a new version, a kind of radical new version, of the uh, Igor Stravinsky classic work, Histoire de which is receiving its 100th birthday this year. And as a part of its birthday present, we're completely redoing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that means that we've taken the original text by Ramuz, which is a very fine text, uh, but we are, for this performance, at least discarding it and replacing those words with Luisa's poems from Tijuana Book of the Dead. <laughs> uh, the dance collective from Tijuana, Lux Boreal, will join us, as will the improvising flutist Wilfrido Terrasas for an extraordinary evening. I hope if you haven't thought about coming to join us, I hope you will do so. It will be really, really a lot of fun. Um, Luis is the recipient of a number of awards and recognitions. He's a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2005 for his 2004 nonfiction account of, uh, called The Devil's Highway, a story of a, of a family of Mexican immigrants lost in the Arizona desert. His 2009 novel, Into the Beautiful North, is a big read selection by the National Endowment for the Arts and has been chosen by 50 different cities as a community read. There are, the list is long, and I think we could fill the time talking about Luis's accolades, but can I tell you that for me, more important than any of those awards is who he is as a person. He is the combination of a total badass and a guy with a heart of gold. And if there is anything that's going to get us out of this mess, it's Luis Urrea and people like him. So please welcome him. The day together. Uh, in rehearsal, so if it feels like we've begun a conversation four or five hours ago, that's actually not just an illusion, it's a point of fact. Uh, and, but I think the one thing we didn't talk about that I've enjoyed talking to you about, about, about with you in previous conversations is a little bit about your biography, just a little bit about how we arrived here at this point and where you came from, where you were born, and what your early life was like, and, and, and what makes Luis Urrea from that standpoint. And I'm going to take a sip of water and I'm going to keep away from this part. It's tequila, man. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go. I was born in Tijuana. Uh, you know where the main drag turns left and heads towards the dumb track? Revolution. I was born there, a little, a little drugstore, a little botica. I'm from Colonia Independencia, if there are any Tijuanans. Oh, people know good stuff here. <laughs> from Rampa Independencia. The house was Rampa Independencia 1002. Uh -huh. Still there. Fantastic. If anybody's uh, into the beautiful North fan, the, the model for Atomico, the world's super gangsta cholo, was actually my cousin Hugo. <laughs> Atomico's a great character. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks. Imagine being his cousin. <laughs> and, and, um, and Hugo, he truly is the bad guy. Hugo talks like this, okay? <laughs> right? He talked like this when he was seven. <laughs> <laughs> you know those guys? I always joke on the road that he was the first person in the family to grow a Zapata mustache like when he was 11. <laughs> he had two whiskers, you know? <laughs> All right. Um, and 
that was a, that was a, you know, to me, Tijuana was wonderland, yeah. you know. It was where my, we lived in a house with my grandma, my aunts, my cousins, a bunch of dogs, my mom and my dad, and most of you know, my father was from Sinaloa, from Saja Sinaloa. My mom was from Manhattan <laughs> and was sort of a, a blue blood socialite who, through some weird alchemical process, met my dad, fell in love, married him, and then rushed off to old Mexico. And I always imagine my mom thinking, well, I'm going to the Hacienda. <laughs> you know? Anthony Quinn and Gilbert Rowland will be there. There'll be gauchos, perhaps, from Argentina. <laughs> and, and that wasn't the case? No. No. And uh, in those days, the rampa wasn't paid. It was the dirt, you know? And, and I think she, she had a really hard time. It was really shocking to her, um, her new life. Um, and, you know, it's hard for me to express how awesome it was to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but there was so much, if you know, if those of you who know La Independencia will know this, but it was a place where everything was possible. We had this insane dirt street full of rocks and boulders. You had to drive really slowly because it would tear out the bottom of your car if you hit a mark. But at the end of our street that came out down around above 9th Street near the police station. But on the hill up above the Rampa, there was a castle. Mm. Right? It's still there. Mm. And some, you know, being, being Mexico, the guy painted it yellow. <laughs> so the castle painted yellow with battlements and stuff. That was incredible. And halfway down the Rampa, in, in, a, in a kind of a John Irving detail, there was a house at the bottom of the hill and they had a bear. <laughs> <laughs> and it was changing to our youngest kid, Rosario Chayo. Um, I've been telling her about my, my, my rough days, you know. I had a rough time, street life, you know. And so we had her here, we drive her down and I prepared her. Now wait a minute, we're going back to the hood. Prepare yourself. And we drive into the hood, and there are people jogging. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a Starbucks, right? It's next to the Bottega de Neta. Uh, right? And I said, just wait till you see our apartments, man. And we drove down there, and they're all like Miami Vice pastels with palm trees. And she's like, hardcore dad. <laughs> and the only thing I could do to defend myself was, when I was a kid, if you was running down the street, you were being chased by cops, man! She was like, nah, nah. <laughs> so everything gentrified. And then can you tell me just a little bit about, you know, your life in Sinaloa? You had almost a double, a double life in, in Sinaloa, in, 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 in northern Baja, and also in, in San Diego. So yeah. it's also part of your childhood. Yeah. Well, you know, Sinaloa, it, it, it's interesting. Um, uh, in fifth grade, we moved to Claremont. And I could not believe it. But some, so a couple of things happened. And one of those was being taken to Mexico for my various extended stays in Sinaloa. One of the things that I was astounded by when we got to Claremont is y'all have lawns. Like, people up here have big green lawns? I thought people were rich, right? How do they spend money putting grass, water on grass? The second thing I discovered was sliced bread. That was awesome. Sure, people don't believe me out of the world, but I tell them, man, if you're like me, you grew up eating peanut butter sandwiches on corn tortillas, man. Right? La peanut butter. <laughs> right? And you put it in a hot tortilla, and the freaking peanut butter would melt. <laughs> right? And this is how you ate it. Am I wrong? You'd be like, that. <laughs> and then they brought Wonder Bread out, and I was like, dang! This is the coolest thing I'd ever seen. It's so good. Cool. That's it. Slice bread is awesome. So, um, so I was, I, I, it's interesting because in Logan I still had, you know, my Tijuana accent. I was human, you know, Spanglish, right? People's wives were their wife. -a. You had a bike and una bica. Cake and a cakey. Except the old ladies would make it a little cakey, so 
dar un quequisito. ¿Quieres un quequisito? Right? And then I got to clarify. And they had no idea what to make of that. And I realized as survival, I, I left my dad's accent and took on my mom's. And I started speaking like this. You know? A um, person of this descent, as if the only reason you could object is it is is on the basis of tribal association when in point of fact everyone is the father of daughters and everyone has roots in Sinaloa if you want to if you want to think of it that way. And until we do that, then we really are lost. I saw a wonderful bit of data the other day that ninety one percent of the Americans living in Mexico are illegal. They're undocumented. <laughs> Well, I don't think I could have uh, finished that as well as you just did. And so, if you'll pardon me, I'll say a quick goodbye before we go on to our questions. And uh, this has been a conversation with Luis Orea, and I'm Stephen Schick, and we're very grateful to the Helen Edison Lecture Series, to the San Diego Symphony, and to our intrepid audience for having been yeah. here. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Let's go back. There are fences everywhere. And as a teacher, like you, I teach, you know, um, in Chicago, which is an incredibly segregated city, though nobody will admit it. You see those fences in your classroom, and you have to do things to overcome it. You have to subvert it. And I think the way to subvert this is through art. Art is dangerous. If art is not revolutionary, it's propaganda. And the reason, all you need to know is whenever there's a dictatorial takeover of a country, they kill poets really fast. It's because writing is subversive. And so when I go to Carbondale and talk to those kids, I had to go as far down the basics of our shared identity as I could. And I would tell them, you don't know you're sacred. And they're like, oh, but I get sacred, man, I'm sacred. You know, I'd say, really? What about this? Mm -hmm. And they start laughing. Yeah, giant tortilla. What are you crazy? And say, yeah, you don't know that sacred. And then you tell them the history of the tortilla, and you say this food has been perfect for ten thousand years without a change, not a single change for at least ten thousand years. And I tell them, how many women do you think have done this over ten thousand years? Yeah, a million, ten million, a hundred million. And how about the men doing it? And you know what? Every single time they did this, they said a little prayer for you. And you'd see all the bad you'd be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You realize all those stories they drew their grandparents yeah, told wherever it was. There's a reason those stories are there, that people through time are trying to hand you a legacy of sanity, of humanity. And it's it, it pains me so much that it's been subverted into these these nets and traps and knots and they're exclusionary when the reality is there is a matrix of our humanity that unites us. There is no them. There's only us. Well, you know, I, I, I think. Um, but when you go talk to their kids down in Carbondale, they're just like, like flinching, particularly because of the rhetoric that has built up. And they did nothing to deserve that. And so my job, I mean, I understand, look at me, I'm the Irish looking Mexican. So when I first walk in, they're like, oh yeah, right, you're Mexican. And they test me, they're like, orale, wey, que onda? Pues aquí echando relajo, wey. That I didn't get, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can say, it's inside stuff, man. Inside stuff. No, but you have to pass a little test. But I've realized that we have to pass tests constantly, constantly. as artists, as people, as men. And they're like, you're my first author. You know, you want us to, you can retire with them. Yeah. But to think that you can go and see kids who are feeling scared or feeling embarrassed or ashamed even, and you know, sometimes it's really hard. I, 
I often go to, to the Aspen area, and there's a town, you know, Aspen, we were talking about the maze. Right. Aspen, up on top of the mountain, and the town where all the people who attended them is down that way. It's called Carbondale. Mm -hmm. The Teapot of uh, Book of the Dead, which I read in a single sitting. You it's, did? Absolutely, I did not put it down. And it was, to me, an anthem for those people. It starts with a poem, you who seek grace from a distracted God, the, about someone rising at 4.45 in the morning and finding themselves on Avenue C at 6.45 at a bus stop. And that, to me, I thought, oh my God, this is what, this is what we need to be saying. And so, first of all, I want to thank you for the extraordinary gift of that poetry. Uh, and, and also, I think there is something ravishing about the spell you cast that, is, that has as an overlay this music which came from someplace else but still feels able to belong to that issue. Thank you. Besides, you're fantastic on stage. You have nothing to do with it. You're about today. And because if you can't make it about today, and if you can't make it about here, then why in the hell are we doing it? It has to be about today. And you have to, by the way, I think you have to do that with every bit of art that you do. Stolen from that composition as best I can. So what moves me about Aside from the various double marches in it, yeah, right. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> Except the heavy metal side. Of it, but, um, what really moves me, I think, in it is that, particularly as we started the conversation a while ago, it was based on Beautiful North, and it moved to the poetry. Right. But the whole point of Into the Beautiful North was writing a heroine's journey instead of a hero's journey. Writing a Joseph Campbell classic. Warrior's journey for a 19-year-old woman because it was time, and it's hard to find those concepts moved over unless you see, you know, Mad Max Fury Road or something, and you know, Imperator Furiosa is killing all the bad guys with a truck. But I, I, I wanted to do all of those things that are embodied in this piece of music, the the the, the perilous night journey. You know, the, there's even a trip to the underworld, yes. and there are terrible deals one must make to get to, to what you need to get to. Not only, I think, to save yourself, but to save your people. And uh, when you told me what you were doing, what you were thinking, I just flipped out because I thought, yes, that's fantastic. You know, putting this concept of borders into a new room. Let me have it if it doesn't work. <laughs> well, it's good for you I'm so brilliant, because <laughs> this, is, this is what I was telling Brenda all after this one, because I see you are, indeed. I felt so self-conscious, and I kept going to Cindy, my wife's here, I kept going, I look really stupid up there. <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of movement going around, and a lot of um, trying to read my poetry in the dark, trying not to trip over stairs. And we'll have better life for you tomorrow. Man, I was like, I kept saying, I'm going to fall down. I'm going to fall down. Um, but I think it's it's kind of, I mean, we've, we, we hung out in yeah. Anaheim chatting over some incredibly delicious junk food one day. Yes, we did. Um, so we've talked about some of this, but, you know, I, I part of the thing about my upbringing was music, constant mm -hmm. music. And to be able to take part in this musical and this dance-related performance that's going to make people think anew, see anew, means everything. Because this is the gist of everything I've tried to do. And I told you when I when I wrote the, the new novel, I was thinking of Respighi of all people. Right? You know, I was the scenario of what we were talking about. The other half is what we'll do on Saturday with you. And those are the those are the bookends for me, which root this experience that we're having in San Diego to a broader cultural context. Right. When I first came to UC San Diego, I'll say, and I think with some shame, that there were lots of international connections amongst my colleagues, both in the music department and beyond. But they all were all to Paris or to Berlin. Or and that's still very often the case. And literally, and I'm sorry to say not to sound too much like Sarah Palin, but I, I, from the end of my street, I can see Mexico. <laughs> and, and, 
<laughs> it's, it's about time we started making art together, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm really so pleased to have, in the context of this wonderful festival that I've put together with my colleagues in the San Diego Symphony, the chance to engage with you. And I, I wonder, first of all, what does it feel like uh, to have your work transposed with this music, which was actually made without, first of all, Stravinsky sitting in Switzerland, relatively calm and placid in the middle of carnage. The First World War is raging around him, and he is sitting in this kind of calm place, writing a piece about a soldier who sells his soul to the devil in exchange for a violin. One of the things that made me want to change that text out is, is that in the time of war, this is a very kind of happy-go-lucky story. I thought, well, this guy didn't have cannons going off down, down his street. So is there some version of that uh, selling your soul? Or is there some modern version of being a warrior that we could find? And I have to tell you, I think I told you it, where roughly half the percussions Percussionists were on the Tijuana side and roughly half on the, on the United States side. And we could not see each other, but we could hear each other. And the rehearsals were, were held, a rehearsal, I should say, was held just before the performance by leaning into that fence and speaking quickly to people and having the words sort of propagate out. And uh, it was one of the most extraordinary things. I've never been involved in an ensemble piece where she died, I think, 95 while bowling. So i <laughs> <laughs> that. That's the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Don't you want to just be conducting and then keel one day? I want to be typing. I say, feel uh -oh. better now and then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sometimes feels closer than you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if we could tie this conversation into the events that we're doing this this week, because this is this this conversation takes place in the con in the context, and that context is a is a is a celebration of art and music and and literature. Right. Um, about this place, and you know, you're calling this festival, it's about time, but it's also about place, and it's about our the way we look at place. And and you and I took, talked at length today, and I think many people in this room know that uh, last Saturday we took uh, 75 percussionists. I was terrorized. Those guys, who we were they hard on me at first, and I realized they were having a great time. It was one of the funniest things they'd ever seen, me in terror. <laughs> you know, but they were also testing to see what kind of person I was. Could they trust me? Could I take it? Was I was I a good guy or not? It's a big deal to be a good guy. And uh, at, you know, there was a certain point when Grace came in the room where you could see those men decide. You know, you could really hurt me and maybe ruin my career. And I'm going to trust you anyway. And I felt responsible to them. That whatever my differences with them were. And I think that happens all across the board with the characters that I, I, I don't want to misrepresent. Um, so you know you can have fun with stereotypes. There's I would say one stereotypical, in my opinion, character on purpose in all the group in the deep world, and that's one of the girlfriends on the trip. She's sort of like a a, a, a control in a science experiment. I see. Right. Right. This is what sort of a small town middle class girl might think when all of her friends are so extravagant. <laughs> when I'm out there talking to the world, and I always tell them, if you think the American dream doesn't work, just imagine this. A guy from Sinaloa, undocumented, his only skill was talking to dogs, <laughs> came to the U.S. and he's a multimillionaire now. <laughs> Come on. I know, what am I doing? Um, but, uh, so yeah, those those those, uh, those characters all are from all over, and they, they have input because you live. I think you're, yeah, but the, the 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 I mean the real model for people. Mm -hmm. A little bit of trivia you might enjoy. Hugo, his last name is Hugo Millan Urrea, right? His dad's name was Millan, and Urrea, his mom's <coughs> Tia Leti, no, his Tia. And my cousins from Rosario took him a copy. Ah, so he's, he, he knows it. Yeah, they said, we're taking Tacho a copy of the book. And then there was a silence, you know, I was like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> And so I finally wrote to my cousin, Enrique, who's a Mexican ambassador. And I, they would call him Emba. And I said, Emba, what happened? What did Tacho say? And he said, no, Tacho's become insufferable. <laughs> he carries it around, he says. <laughs> Let's be I told you I was special. <laughs> uh, and I think he was amused. And then uh, about 
six months later, a message came from Tacho. He said, I think you owe me some royalties. <laughs> I was like, well, it's not you. I don't even know your last name, but you, you know, I'm, I'm giving you a homenaje. Um, and Nayeli is a fantastic character. She's named as daughter. She's on Facebook. That is not face, you Facebookers. She's on Facebook. And uh, I wanted to show, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the story of her birth at the end of that, uh, of that book is extraordinary. So, some of you may not have read these things, and you may wonder what we're talking about. But first of all, do yourself a favor and read those, those extraordinary books. That's right, do my bank account a favor. Yes, <laughs> please do. And, uh, and so the, the, the three that comprise the sort of uh, the, 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 the Holy Trinity of the, into the beautiful north, they actually come from different places because Ayeli comes from Tijuana, I mean, at least it's someone from Tijuana, and mm -hmm. Tacho is somebody from Sinaloa, and Atomico also from Tijuana. I knew at the time the only gay citizen of this little town, or certainly the only out gay citizen back when I was a kid, and uh, he survived by making himself so out, yeah. so in your face, that they would back off. They were like, so, okay, you know. They call him Tachito and Machito. <laughs> and he would put them down. Yeah. And, um, I, I used to watch him from a distance because my family wouldn't let me meet him. <laughs> I had like love beads and hair. Like, oh, this was those no. <laughs> does, he, did he, does he like his representation? <laughs> I mean, how, how does he feel about being in the book? Well, uh, he and I met in 1980. So a lot, of the, a lot of his kind of jokes and mannerisms are from hanging out with him in 1980. But, uh, and I once told him, I, I, when I first met him, I said, Tacho, man, I've been watching you since 1970. He said, I te quiero, He said, de <laughs> Mexicans and all this stuff they need. How subversive would that be to have somebody on their princess cruise with a big Mai Tai, <laughs> rooting for these guys to get away, yeah. or for Tacho to get a boyfriend. Sure, hope he gets a man. <laughs> um, I thought that would be cool. And it happens, right? Well, it does happen. I think it does. It right? does. Yeah, Tacho looks up. Now, you know, Tacho is a real person. I mean, he's inspired by a real person now, Tacho. It would be on the surface seen as, as simple and unproblematic, and you poke out a little bit, you'll find a kernel of melancholy. And it feels like those two things are plugged into one another. My question about, about that book, but then going on to the other work, I'm, I'm thinking especially of the beautiful north, is how, how subversive is your characterization of those characters? How, how much are you playing with our preconceptions versus what we are actually seeing? It's all subversive, man. <laughs> Come on. Um, yeah, particularly in, in Into the Beautiful North, I thought, I would like to write a kind of a pop novel, and I would like to make all the heroes in that novel people that everybody attacks or looks down on in this culture right now. And uh, you know, I was really thinking how interesting it would be to have a group of undocumented young women seeking help because then he put out a tub and they filled it with hot water. And he put a bar of ivory soap in it. He said, you're going to thank me there's ivory soap in there because it floats. And I was like, why? And then the garbage paper started lining up. And they took their shoes off. And I ended up kneeling in the garbage, washing feet. Mm -hmm. Oh, Vaughn, infernal old man. And uh, at first I was like, yeah, I'm blessing these people, man. I'm so, I'm so righteous right now. you know." And uh, it didn't take long for me to realize they were blessing me. They were giving me their wounded feet. And, their, and uh, I, I cried. I cried the whole time. 150 people. And I just, and I couldn't move. I was sore, you know. He was very pleased with himself. <laughs> um, one, one of the things about the, the, um, the book that we're talking about across the way right now is, is harsh. It is sometimes really difficult to read. The story of your father, of course, I mean, a lot of ways, my father gave his life to give me everything that, that would happen. Um, all that being said, I graduated and I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, I was really lost, I think. Um, 
we were plunged into the insane hopelessness of poverty because the insurance company was pushed off a highway. Um, the, the insurance company wouldn't pay us his life insurance or his auto insurance because it was approved. Even though we had pictures of the red wing saying it said it would be in it. Then I ended, ended up having this really weird nail duel with the chief of police and that stuff. Like, that really, I was just a kid. I didn't know. Um, so I didn't know what to do with myself. And I was searching for meaning like people do. And for a while, I, I was a movie extra. Because, hey, Southern California, right? <laughs> Um, and I was really lucky that way. I, I got to do some really wonderful stuff. I, I got to extra in a Chuck Norris movie. <laughs> yeah, I use that for fake cred, you know. <laughs> Tijuana, Chuck Norris. <laughs> Enough said. Enough said. Um, but during that period, some friends of mine had been going to Tijuana with a missions crew. And I was not really interested in especially because they were Baptists. So are you kidding? No, I mean, uh, and uh, I had my movie extra of long blonde hair and all this. And it was led by, I'm sure some of you knew him, Pastor Vaughn, this amazing, well-known pastor in town, who was a, 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 I used to tell him he was a Zen Baptist instead of a Zen Baptist. <laughs> uh, and at the same time that I started working with Vaughn, I got a job as a pilot with TA at his college with the great Cesar Gonzalez. So I had the coolest love poem my girlfriend. Yeah. I'll be a rich man. You know, I'll be like that example. I have a red jet that says Luis on it. Oh, no. <laughs> and um, I I was big in the drama department. I, I went to Claremont High. Yes. Richmond High. <laughs> um, and uh, I was a, a theater kid. And I, I came to UCSD, our beloved UCSD. Uh, as a theater major, and then went over to the dark side and started doing writing. Um, and uh, in my senior year, it's a roundabout answer, but it's a deep answer. In my senior year at UCSD, my dad died in the hands of Mexican cops. And it was a really awful experience um, for all of us. And uh, the, the capper, the awful death that he had is that they sold me personally, his corpse. They wouldn't let us bury him. And uh, I had come into money he was bringing home that they didn't find. Um, and we used that to buy his body. And my niece and nephew were here, their dad, my brother Juan, and I and my, my brothers and sisters, we took up a collection to be buried like that. Yeah. And uh, at that time, we had to bury him in an unmarked grave in Tijuana. It's hard. Yeah. That was my senior year, man. And then I had to go back to school, and I thought, what do I do, do with that? that? Yeah. So I didn't know how to express myself except in writing, ultimately. And I wrote a piece about his death and these horrible kind of jolting dreams I kept having about him. They were so vivid that it felt like he was coming back. The first one, he came back and didn't know he was dead. And he kept saying, what, what happened? Hey, Bungalow B, why did you kill Bungalow B? And they say, wait, well, there's a Bungalow B. I said, because it's un vaquero. Oh, right? Um, and that was, you know, and then they would, they would give me, because I hadn't heard Mexican pop or Mexican rock music. So it became this cultural literature. And then we would go on these long journeys with my uncle. He had a big, nowadays you'd get killed, but in those days, he had a huge white Ford LTD that said press the mm -hmm. <laughs> And everybody would make way for him. And we would go to these towns and we would look for the newspaper office and find the publisher of every newspaper. This way Carlos Subar, they're starting a lot. Ah. And they would show us like the background of all the cities. The great education. So you were really plugged into the royalty of Sinaloa. The, the Accidentally, I yeah. Was, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I went from you know, Mr. Mr. The stuff that drove him insane, famous monsters of Filmland magazine, mm. Mad magazine. They thought, yes, it's not moving, you know. So my dad started these long, several month residencies in Sinaloa, and the first one of those, I was fourteen. 
and we took a 27 hour bus ride, right? And my dad blew my mind forever. In fact, it's in the author's notes in the new book. He gave me the Godfather. He said, Mijo, lee esto. Te va a cambiar la vida. <laughs> and I started reading, and I had never seen any of it. That's right. <laughs> um, and this amazing experience of suddenly living in Sinaloa, you know, and going out to the <coughs> mango, the family had a mango with that. We'd go there at dawn and knock mangoes out of the tree, and that's a you know, breakfast. And there were huge iguanas everywhere. I was in love every three seconds, right? <laughs> and one of the miracles for me was my uncle owned the movie theater. It's the movie theater that's in, in the movie, Cine Pedro Infante. And I'd go to the movies. All, like every two nights, there'd be a new double or triple feature. And my uncle owned the radio station. And he hated <laughs> rock and roll music. So he would save up all the rock and roll 45s that they'd send him, and he'd give me a box of them. <laughs> 